Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of Space Science with Python. Today it's again a small concept or theory lesson with some tooling I would like to show you. And before we go into it, let's have a small recap what we did last time in our coding session. So last time we used the Dwarf Planet series to understand and get used to orbital elements. And series is, yeah, let's say quite, uh, quite a yeah good neighbor let's say because it's not getting close to earth or other planets it's just revolving around the sun at a very very safe distance but around over 20,000 objects in the solar system have been classified as so-called near-earth objects so we will get to this topic in the future but what's important to know is that these objects are yeah getting they might get close to earth and some of these objects, as they are shown or listed at the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies website from the JPL, and they have also quite close approaches to our home planet. So, for example, we have here a small table with current close approaches within the next 60 days at a distance of less than 0.05 AU. And, yeah, no age limit means, um, yeah, it's linked to the diameter, so... Yeah, let's let's take a look at all size asteroids. So, yeah, larger ones as up to a kilometer or more, and also very small ones which have only a few meters in size, which are only a few meters in size. Now, here you see the table with different object names, um, like for example this one here, two thousand twenty one KH two, which has a close flyby basically today or already had at a distance of around 19.23 LD. So LD means lunar distance. So one lunar distance is the average distance between the Earth and the Moon. So like around about 300,000 kilometers. And with also data like for example the um, relative velocity, the diameter of the object and so on. So all these objects, they are, let's say, quite close visitors. But the question is, uh, what, what does close mean, right? I mean, we have like here 19 LD, 15, 4.6, 2 LD. This looks quite close, an object of maximum of 30 meters. And again, we have over 20,000 objects. And the question is, do we need to track all these objects? Do we need to observe all these objects? What all about the orbital elements? Do they change over time? So if we have a close approach, do the orbital elements change or are they changing all the time or not? And of course, there are yeah, numerical simulations being conducted to see whether these orbital elements, elements change over time. They have also a certain uncertainty, so like a measurement error. I will show you this in a moment. So the position of the object is not always 100% clear and it might change over time. But we will learn a theoretical model or concept today, how we can compute changing orbital elements in the vicinity of any planet, for example, our home planet Earth, and how to yeah, recompute or recalculate changing orbital elements without doing any extensive numerical analysis. Of course, numerical analysis that consider all gravitational perturbations from Jupiter, Saturn, the Earth, and so on, are way more precise than just a simple two-body problem. So, for example, considering only the object and the Sun, or the object and the Earth. But, let's say, yeah, considering the measurement uncertainties, it's, it's a good approach I would like to show you. And this approach is called the so-called sphere of influence. So, let's take a look at this small picture here, where we have our home planet, the Earth, and the Moon. And the moon is yeah, revolving around, around the Earth. And of course, the Earth is revolving around the sun. Uh, but we don't see the sun now here. Let's imagine the sun is somewhere here on the bottom right corner. And an object that revolves around the sun has, of course, or the, yeah, with, this, with the sun in the center, has orbital elements. Or the orbital elements are provided with respect to the sun, of course. But... When the object comes close to the Earth, we it might maybe be useful to compute the orbital elements with respect to the Earth. So to see 
what is the closest approach um what are the what is the movement within the vicinity of the earth but first we need to define or quantify what is the vicinity of the earth of course based on gravitational theory the gravitational influence of any object in space is infinite but there are some very useful approximations that make life easier and this one is called the sphere of influence and the sphere of influence is, is an imaginary sphere around yeah like the earth or mars or whatsoever where we can switch between a reference frame that is sun-centered to the reference frame that is for example earth-centered and the size of the um, of the sphere of influence is computed with a simple approximation equation i would like to show you now so basically the sphere of influence is um, a radius and it's yeah being approximated by the semi major x of the or, um, of the of the object so in our case the earth so semi major axis is 1 approximately 1 and this is times the mass of the minor object divided by the mass of the larger object. Oh, I spoiled now some exponent, but doesn't matter. Um, the smaller mass here is the mass of the Earth, and the larger mass, it's not shown here now, is the mass of the Sun. And this now to the power of two-fifths. So this is basically the equation that leads to the so-called radius of the sphere of influence covering earth yeah an imaginary sphere that can be shown here like with a dashed or dotted um, dotted line or that's a quarter of the of the of the of the sphere of influence and yeah we will compute the sphere of influence uh, of our home planet in our next coding video on wednesday but first let's get some idea how the sphere of influence might help us in computing um, the change the changes of orbital elements of asteroids or objects that approach the earth closely so let's say, say within the sphere of influence we have an earth centric coordinate system and outside the dashed line we have a sun centric coordinate system and the sun again is on the top uh, bottom right corner somewhere here yeah very far away and now we have an object for example here coming from the from the upper part of our screen yeah it's in a, in a, in a sun centric coordinate system it's revolving around the sun and now it approaches the border crossing the sphere of influence of the earth and here we compute then the state vector of the object computed then with respect to the yeah or changing the state vector to a earth centric coordinate system so we have to of course consider the position and the velocity of earth within the solar system and then we can compute the trajectory of the orbit of the object within the sphere of influence where we then yeah neglect the sun for a while but we can compute yeah maybe a changing orbit of this object yeah, that is, you know, getting close to our home planet yeah, as a close approach and then leaving it again. And at some point it touches the sphere of influence again. And at this point we change again from an Earth-centric coordinate system to a Sun-centric coordinate system. Where we also have to recompute the state vector, um, that considering the position and also the velocity. And then we have to we have changed orbital elements with respect to the sun. So without any strong numerical simulations or extensive stuff, with a simple yeah, two times two body problem or dividing the problem into a two times two body problem, we can compute the changes or the, 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 yeah, the changes of object that approach our home planet closely. And this is basically the concept of the sphere of influence, just creating an imaginary sphere around our home planet where we can compute um, trajectories in an Earth-centric coordinate system. So this is what we will use in our next coding sessions or coding tutorials. In the one on Wednesday, we will compute first the, um, the, 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 the size of the sphere of influence, and then we will have a, a simple 
calculation with an object that does not cross the sphere of influence and then in a week we will use an object that actually enters the sphere of influence and see how or if the orbital elements, elements change at all. Now, working with orbital elements requires a little bit more than just yeah, the, the, the orbital elements provided by any website. So let's go, for example, to our database lookup. We have here the very first object that was listed in the close approach list. The, oh no, I just misclicked, I think. Ah, it's 200, uh, WF201. Ah, I used this one for our Wednesday session already. Um, with a, an object with a minimum distance of 13 lunar distances. And we see here we have orbital elements given, the eccentricity, the semi-major axis, the perihelion, the inclination and so on. So all the orbital elements we um, learned in a few sessions ago with the corresponding value, value, value of a lot of digits and some kind of uncertainty. The uncertainty is given in one sigma. And to be honest, this this value doesn't help us in much so one could think okay cool i'm now generating some kind of distribution with this uncertainty and then compute possible solutions of of of, uh, of these objects orbit but the uncertainties are linked together so for example if you have uh, if you have an uncertainty of yeah let's say here this one and an uncertainty of the uh, semi major axis it doesn't mean that in an object with uh, with an error at the upper upper limit of the eccentricity corresponds to a semi-major axis also in the upper limit. So the uncertainties are linked. So for example, a smaller eccentricity could correspond to a higher semi-major axis, for example. Uh, just, 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 uh, now it doesn't matter really whether, whether this is true or not, it's just about the concept that these uncertainties are linked. And the linkage between all these uncertainties given in the so-called covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix is some something we will use also in the future so that we can compute not only the uh, position of an object of an object but more like the um, probability area where this object could be because our measurements are never a hundred percent precise there is always some kind of uncertainty that leads to yeah position deviations of maybe a few kilometers or even a few hundreds of kilometers and this is rather important if you, for example, plan to observe an object and then you think, see, wait a second, I don't observe it, well, maybe it's a few arc seconds more to the left or to the right because of this uncertainty. But again, this is something for the, for the future. But in our next tutorial, we will not only consider this sphere of influence that is uh, important, we will also round the values here a little bit because the uncertainty or the numbers here and the uncertainty, they suggest some kind of precision we don't have. So we cannot really um, have an uncertainty that is that precise. Yeah, of course, depends a little bit on the on the context. But from a measurement side perspective, and of course, the objects have been observed by a telescope, so these are based on measurements, and these are measurement uncertainties. This is an uncertainty that. Um, or it's a, it's, a, it's a high precision uncertainty that's not 100% correct, so we have to correct the precision of these values with, a, this, with the corresponding um, uncertainty that is given. We will get to this in the next session as well, so the next coding session will take care of the sphere of influence and also on how to round um, values with the corresponding uncertainties properly. So it's very important to also understand this concept of rounding values. Might, it might sound really trivial, but in, measure, in, in measurement techniques and so on, you cannot provide thousands of digits of some measurement error or uncertainty. But we will get to this um, later. And regarding the covariance metrics, we don't have it here now in our um, GUI, but the corresponding API of the database provides us covariance matrices. So there's a REST API for all the different calls. And if you, for example, look here, what kind of parameters you can query, um, you can um, output here, output the data in full precision. And if requested, also the output in full precision, unless you use the covariance matrix. So 
you can request for the covariance metrics, then you get really also the corresponding errors or the covariance for all the orbital elements. Here as well, I'll put the orbital covariance if available so that we can compute the probability space of uh, or the probability solution domain of our orbital elements. Now this was a very short video, a little bit theory about the sphere of influence. So let's have a small recap. We talked about the sphere of influence that we will use to see whether objects are coming close to our home planet and that may those orbital elements may, might be altered by a close approach or not. So on Wednesday we will have a look at a close approach that is not crossing the sphere of influence just to get have a small warm up of this topic and also to see how to round um, orbital element values properly. And on Saturday we will consider an asteroid that's crossing the sphere of influence where we then also change the um, reference frame from the sun-centric to the earth-centric coordinate system so that we see whether or how orbital elements are changed by close approaches. I hope you enjoyed this short Saturday session and um, you're looking forward to some coding on Wednesday and also next Saturday. Until then, as always, take care and see you next time.